landscaping workshop. Um, however, this is the first one that we've done as a webinar. So um, we're trying this out and we'll see how it goes. I'm Julie Bolthouse. I'm the Deputy Director of Land Use with the Piedmont Environmental Council. And uh, for those of you who do not know, um, I, we are a nonprofit organization that was formed in 1972 um, that covers a nine county region from Loudoun County down to Albemarle County. We work to conserve land and uh, we do a lot of stuff, conserve land, create high quality communities, strengthen rural economies, celebrate um, historic resources, protect air and water quality, build smart uh, transportation networks, protect sustainable energy choices, restore wildlife habitat and improve people's access to nature. We cover a lot of ground, um, but our overarching goal is to empower citizens to make a positive impact at home and in their communities. Through sustainable landscaping workshops like this, um, we hope to uh, empower people to uh, restore wildlife habitat and functionality of their uh, landscape. And to share, um, we invite experts to share the wealth of knowledge that they can bring so that they can help you make these sort of changes in your own community and at home. So PEC, like many of you, has done a lot of gardening during this pandemic. Uh, we actually refreshed our uh, Doug Larson native plant garden that surrounds our office here at 45 Horner Street in Warrington and completed a number of plantings in our community. Here at the Larson Native Plant Garden, we worked with a consultant uh, garden, gardener named Mary Bar Bartlett to thin out overgrown species and move some plantings um, to display them better and relocated some signage so that um, it could present information on native plants better. So I would encourage you, if you have the opportunity to come out here to our office, 45 Horner Street in Warrington, and visit and just take a walk around our garden, it's both in the front and in the back, it's fairly large. We also uh, work with, uh, we worked with uh, Fauquier County Parks and Rec this summer to install a native plant garden at Crockett Park down near Midland in Fauquier. And we've also worked with partners throughout the Upper Rappahannock watershed to plant over 20,000 trees on almost 100 acres of stream buffers. So we've been busy. Um, so we hope that these presentations will provide you with some tools to get you started on your own projects at home. We have three presenters with us today. Um, Jim McLone from the Department of Forestry, uh, Tim O'Weiler with the Extension Service, and David Wood with the Chesapeake Stormwater Network. The webinar will be recorded um, and uh, um, we will be providing uh, the tools and online resources that are our presenters mention at least some of them that they mention, um, and they'll be posted next week on a link that will be sent out to attendees. Um, so you can have the recorded webinar there and also some of the resources um, that are mentioned. We'll be taking questions throughout the program. Um, so, and we'll be trying to get as many of them, get to as many of them as we can, but we will try to follow up afterward if we're unable to, to answer some, some good questions. We'll send them out to our uh, presenters and ask if they can follow up afterward. You also will have their contact information on the link that we will provide. So you can follow up with them yourself afterward if you prefer that. But throughout, please um, submit your questions in the chat function so that we can uh, try to address as many as we can. And um, with that, I'd like to invite our first speaker, Jim McGlone, to talk to us about building a garden ecosystem. Jim, are you ready? All right, well, he pulls up his slides. Almost straight. There we go. Thank you, Julie. Um, and thank you all for giving up your lunch hour to come and talk to us about sustainable landscaping. Uh, I'm going to talk briefly about how to build a functioning garden ecosystem. And there we go. So an ecosystem has three components. It's got the living stuff, the plants, animals, et cetera, uh, the non-living parts, which are the, the sunlight, minerals, and that stuff. And most importantly, and this is, what's make, what is what makes ecosystems interesting uh, and make them systems, is the relationships between, uh, between and among those biotic and abiotic components. 
And it's in those relationships that we start to tell the stories about why we need native plants. And I will hit on a few of those as <clears throat> we go forward. So one of the things that you need to keep in mind is that all gardens are ecosystems. How well they function is gonna depend on what you put into your garden. Um, the other thing that I want you to keep in mind is your garden is part of a landscape. So you're not going to have to put everything into your garden. There's going to be stuff around you, like this picture on the right is a red maple flower. Red maple is a really important early season pollinator plant. It's what supports our generalist bees uh, that come out early, like the queen bumblebees. But in my experience, we already have enough red maple in the landscape, so you probably don't need to build or plant that. Um, look around, look at some of the natural areas in, around you, uh, try and figure out what ecosystems they are, good resources, the DCR native plant or natural plant communities, which is largely based on soil types. So it's important that you look at your soil type and match it up with a natural plant community and then go out and look at that community or look at, at the description of the community and add some of the things that are not missing. One of the other things that I want you to remember is we're talking about gardening to share the landscape with native uh, wildlife. Well, share is the important part. It's also your garden. And if there's something you particularly want to put in your garden that maybe doesn't belong there, that's okay. As long as you've got about 80 to 90% um, locally native plants, you're gonna be doing a good job in supporting the wildlife. Now in the garden, um, what you're going to attract as you build this ecosystem is going to be primarily insects and birds, things that can fly and find what may be an isolated po pocket of um, habitat. And the insects play some important roles in the garden. Uh, first of all, there's herbivores. Um, all gardeners are aware of the fact that a lot of insects eat various parts of the um, your plants. And for a long time, that was considered a bad thing. But as we look at this monarch caterpillar, we're starting to change that attitude. Along with the herbivores, though, we also get predators and parasites. And this is not just the insects, it's also the birds. These are three lacewing uh, larvae that are feeding on aphids. And if you build a balanced ecosystem, you're going to attract these things, these predators uh, or parasites that are going to keep those plant potential plant pests in check. So you're not gonna have an outbreak of pests. Another, of course, big role that insects play is as pollinators. This is a sweat bee on uh, Joe Pieweed, they help the plants make the seeds and help the plants continue to grow in your garden. Um, insects are also uh, play a big recycling role, particularly the beetles and the uh, ants are very good at dragging organic matter into the ground and enriching the soil and recycling uh, a lot of nutrients and things. So. Um, beetles in particular, there's a one group called um, dung beetles, and they're really important in recycling animal dung. And a final role that some insects play is as seed dispersers. Ants are particularly important seed dispersers for our spring ephemerals, like this uh, spring beauty. And they, so that's another role they play. Birds are also important seed dispersers, and we'll talk a little more about that. So that's the role that the animals play. That's how they're interacting with the plants. And that's how we start to look at those relationships and talk about those relationships between the native plants and the native animals, which are much more, which are much stronger and more diverse than we get with the non-native plants. What you have control over though in your um, garden ecosystem are the plants. And like I said, the the way you select the plants is going to, or the plants you select is going to determine how well your ecosystem works. 
So keep in remember back from uh, elementary or high school biology that some insects go through complete metamorphosis. They start as eggs, they hatch out as larva, the larva feed for a while, then they pupate and become adults, which lay the eggs and start the cycle all over again. And so when we're selecting plants, it's important to keep in mind what the habitat needs of those insects are because they're different at different stages. We need appropriate nesting or egg laying sites. And for a lot of insects, this is those old stems from, that are left over from on the uh, herbaceous plants after the growing season, the stuff that everybody goes out and, oh, we got to clean up my garden in the fall. When you do that, you're removing a lot of nesting and egg laying sites for insects that you, and beneficial insects you want to keep in there. You also need food for the larvae. That's why it's important to have a few aphids in your garden so that there's something to feed those lace wings. Otherwise, you wind up with uh, outbreaks. You also need appropriate pupation sites. And this is another tough sell for a lot of people because a lot of our insects pupate or overwinter in leaf litter. So when you rake up all those leaves and you put them on a bag and you send them off to the landfill or wherever they happen to go in your community, you're actually removing a lot of good insects from your yard. So you need to let those leaves lay so that the insects can finish their life cycle in them. And then you need food for adults. The picture in the lower right is a flower fly on uh, mountain mint, uh, pycnanthium. Flower flies are pollinators as adults, but as larvae, they eat aphids. So that's where it becomes important to make sure that we have all of those things because these are all nectar feeding predators. All of our wasps, which help control the herbaceous insects, are nectar feeders as adults. The same thing with the flower flies, those lace wings I showed you, and these are some of the others. If you don't have the flowers blooming, or if you don't have flowers blooming when the adults are flying, you're not going to get the larvae that are going to help control those pest populations. And of course, there's also the well known story of the relationship between. Um, the monarchs and the uh, milkweed. And one of the things to keep in mind is the relationship is between the milkweed and the monarch caterpillar. The adults will nectar on pretty much anything that provides nectar. So this is an adult, the right picture is an adult monarch on Joe, uh, Joe Pye weed. But if you wanna have monarchs in the environment, you gotta have milkweed for the caterpillars to feed on. And that's true for a lot of our caterpillars. They have a very few native plants that they can feed on. One genus, or in some cases, only a single species. And those caterpillars are important because that's what the birds feed their babies. About 90% of our songbirds feed their young caterpillars. And if we don't have the caterpillars, we're not going to have the um, the birds. A recent study that was done in the DC metro area found that uh, chickadees need six to 9,000 caterpillars to raise a clutch of eggs to fledging. And they have to collect those six to 9,000 caterpillars in a two week period. And they found that if less than 70% of the uh, woody plants in the area were natives, we started to see uh, uh, impacts and reduction in brood efficiency on those chickadees. So we need those native plants to support the caterpillars, to support the birds. Another important um, story is between our native bees and our native plants. We have about 400 uh, species of native bees in the mid-Atlantic and close to a quarter of them are specialists. That means that there is only one or a few plants that they use. Some of them specialize because of when they emerge. So we have a bunch of specialist bees that emerge early in the season and 17 of them 
feed on only one species of willow. But they're also specialists on the spring ephemerals. So it's important to have willow and spring ephemerals in your, uh, in your ecosystem to support those early bees. Those plants will also support generalist bees. We also have some late season specialists. These are bees that just in the past week or two have emerged and are starting to feed on the asters and goldenrods that just started blooming last week and this week and will be blooming for another couple of weeks. There's even a few, one species of bee that specializes on evening primrose. It only comes out late in the day and it nectars and collects pollen from those primroses. We also have some bees that specialize on those unusual flower shapes as bell-shaped flowers uh, for uh, blueberries and huckleberries. So those are, if you've got the right soils for them, those would be good things to include in your garden. And asteracea, which is the asters and a lot of the cone flowers, we've got 59 species of bees that only feed on a few of those species within that family and the same for the heaths. This website, which is on the, the handout Julie mentioned that'll be posted, I guess, next week, is a good place to go and, and learn some more about specialist bees and the plants that they are supported by them. Berries are another important food resource and another important story. Um, in this slide, for, starting in the upper left, we've got flowering dogwood, uh, Actually, all the dogwoods, viburnums, also produce good berries for the birds. Um, black gum and devil's walking stick, um, which is also a really good pollinator plant. And the reason these berries are important, and it's important that we're using native plants, not plants from Eurasia that have cousins that are native to North America, is that what we find is that North American berries are 30 to 50% fat content compared to the Eurasian berries, which are only about 1%. I mentioned this to one of my colleagues this week, and he said, yeah, that makes sense because the wine berries, which are a non-native invasive uh, member of the genus Rubus, are really sweet, and he doesn't have to add sugar when he, to them when he makes jelly out of them. But the native blackberry, which is also in the genus Rubus, is not so sweet, and it needs sugar. The fat content of these berries is really important to get our um, resident birds through the winter, and more importantly, to get the neotropical migrants across the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean to their wintering grounds in South America. So using the native berries or native shrubs that produce berries is uh, important to support the bird population. And the last thing, and I mentioned this already, is overwintering. This is a hard sell for most gardeners. You've got to leave the stems in the garden. Now, since I've taken this, took this picture, We've learned a little more, and so the it's not just leave them alone, don't do any cleanup in the fall, but instead of taking these stems all the way to the ground, what they're recommending now is take them down to 8 to 12 inches, which will actually make them easier for the insects to use next year. And keep in mind that the stems that are out in your garden right now are the stems that are going to get the insects through the winter of 2022 and 2023. So it's not like just leave them out until March and then cut them down. You got to leave them through the whole next growing season and the next winter. And like I said, that is a tough sell, but it's important to uh, support those insects. So how do we get there? It's actually not that difficult. It's diversity. And when I say diversity, I mean vertical, horizontal, and temporal diversity. This is my front yard. I have a ground layer, a shrub layer, understory, and a canopy. It's red maple in the canopy, and then the understory is um, red bud, dogwood, and kind of between the shrub and understory is wing sumac. So, you need a canopy, if you're gonna do a forest uh, system, you need a canopy tree. 
but if you're going to do a meadow system, you still should have that vertical diversity of low growing, medium growing, and tall growing plants. Um, <clears throat> with the, uh, the forest, here are some really good trees that are not that well, that are not as well represented in the landscape. In the upper left is Prunus Americana, that's American plum. This is actually a, a smaller, more of an understory tree. Um, but any of the Prunus, except perhaps Serotina, which is like maple, and there's a lot of it out there. Serotina is the black cherry, that's the big overstory tree. Um, Tilia Americana, which is also known as basswood or American linden, is a really good pollinator plant. Unfortunately, we've had a lot of bee kills when people have been treating these for aphids in parking lots while they were in bloom. In the lower right is um, silky willow, silky willow, which is uh, Salix cerisia, and black willow, which is Salix nigra, are two more common willows in Virginia. There may be a few others that are uh, native to your particular area. And black gum is a good pollinator plant, as well as being a berry plant. Some of the shrubs, as you get uh, lower down, uh, in the upper left is Amorpha fruticosa, uh, false indigo bush, uh, Virginia sweet spire, Itea virginiana, um, shrubby St. John's wort in the lower right, and then uh, service berry, which is another rose family plant, and uh, we have a lot of bees that uh, use those rose family plants. A couple of good generalist uh, plants is um, mountain mint, and uh, which is the low-growing plant in the front here, and then uh, sumac is both a good pollinator plant because it produces little tiny flowers that then become these nice red berries. It's also a pretty striking landscape plant. And then, as I said, you want different layers. This is what my front yard looks like right now. These are mostly late season uh, plants. There's a lot of white snake root and goldenrod in there. The purple is American beautyberry. Those are good uh, winter plant or good winterberry plants for birds. And within the ground layer, you can have different, as I said, different layers. So this would be your sort of mid-layer herbaceous plant. These are the things that get to be about knee high, maybe a little taller. Um, the upper left corner is uh, butterfly weed, which is a milkweed. I think it's probably your best milkweed for your landscape. It's got the bright orange flower, which is not common, and it's not as aggressive a spreader as some of the other milkweed. Um, in the upper right is Baptista australis. This is uh, blue false indigo, uh, verbena, and black-eyed Susans. And it's a little bit of temporal diversity there too. We'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Then below those are the low growing ground cover type plants. Um, in the spring, you can have uh, golden ragwort, which is good generalist pollinator plant. An underused plant, I think, is Virginia strawberry, Fragaria virginiana. It spreads like English ivy. It's a native, it's native to every county in Virginia, and we do have a bee that specializes on this plant. It also produces fruit uh, for the birds, and probably turtles eat it because it's very low growing, and so you can plant this underneath stuff, and it spreads pretty rapidly. Uh, lower right is wood anemone, and lower left is violets. We do have, they are critical for supporting our fritillary butterflies, and they have the advantage of they usually just show up if you let them. So you don't necessarily have to go out and buy them, just let them grow in your yard. When I talk about temporal diversity, usually we're talking about flower bloom time. So uh, in the early spring, you have your spring ephemerals like the May apple and the golden ragwort behind it, which is not a spring ephemeral. That's an evergreen plant, but the May apple will go away pretty rapidly. Uh, Baptistus tinctoris, the um, yellow false indigo, which blooms in June, and then cardinal flower, which blooms in the summer, and New York aster, which blooms right around now. In fact, I took that picture this week in my yard. 
As I said, we need to change our mindset too, that we're not just growing plants, we're growing an ecosystem. And this is a great example of it. This is Golden Alexander. My wife and I went to the nursery. We wanted to add some because it's in the parsley family and we wanted to support the black swallowtail uh, butterflies. Well, when we got to the nursery, we found a couple of plants that already had black swallowtail butterflies or caterpillars on them and that's what we purchased. So when you're building your garden ecosystem, the main thing is that vertical, horizontal, and temporal diversity of native plants. We need to use the natives because that's what supports our native wildlife and where we're going to have multiple relationships between plants and the insects. Remember to keep those dead stems and leaves in or near your garden to support those overwintering insects. One of the things that will happen, especially if you leave the leaves, is you will get fireflies because they live in leaf litter, both as adults and as um, larvae. And that's my contact information. So, Julie, I think we're ready uh, if we've got any questions. Thank you so much, Jim. That's a wonderful, through that. wonderful presentation. Um, I don't have any, well, the one question we did get in the chat was about the chickadee study that you mentioned. Um, I assume yes. we can post that. Um, I'll have to dig it out. Uh, I read about that in uh, Doug Colomay's Nature's Last Be Best Hope. Uh, I would recommend that you read that book because it, that is a whole book about what I just talked about in 20 minutes. It is a great book, absolutely. Okay, so it's referenced okay. in that book. Um, that might be your best bet. Um, we have another question um, from Joe. Uh, it says, can you repeat uh, when it is appropriate to do the cutting in the garden in the spring? Um, in the fall, what you can do is cut the stems down to about eight to 12 inches and that's it. You don't come back and cut them anymore. You let them stand because what we have found is, you know, some of them are going to go away during the next growing season. And that's just like mulch in your garden. Uh, but others are going to get through two winters. And those are the important ones for overwintering. Uh, one that I can think of right, right off the top of my head is dog bane. And we have, when we've gone in in the summer or in the spring and cut some of the dog bane, we have regretted it because what we found was leaf cutter bee larvae in the stems. So you want to leave those until nature says it's time for them to go away rather than you taking them out of the garden because they are an important part of the ecosystem. Uh, just because I think that question, uh, because it said spring, I'm wondering um, what about cutting back um, any uh, excessive growth, not just cutting back your- You mean um, pruning? Uh, yeah, pruning, pruning, can pruning. Be, pruning the live woody plants. You can do that pretty much any time of the year. There are a few plants um, in some places that you don't like. You don't wanna prune elms during the summer because that creates wounds and the elm bark beetles will, will be flocking to them and that's what carries Dutch elm disease. So there are a couple of specific ones, but as far as the rest of the plants, you pretty much do it any time. Although uh, if you prune while they are dormant, that's gonna give them a little bit of a leg up to get started on uh, heat or sealing over that wound uh, during the first growing season. Wonderful. Um, one other uh, comment uh, slash question that we got was about trees and um, leaving them as snags. Um, someone commented 10 to 12 feet as snags, question mark. I mean, is that reasonable? Um, that's certainly reasonable. Um, uh, how tall you want them to be really is more of a risk assessment. So you want them to, you cut them down to where, when they fall, because they will eventually fall. Uh, they're not gonna land on anything you don't want them to land on. So I had left a 40 foot snag further back in my property, but it was more than 40 feet away from the house. 
but yeah, yeah leave standing dead wood is an important component standing and fallen dead wood is an important component of a forest ecosystem yeah absolutely um a good question this is one of those ones that's more maybe more of opinion than it is science at this point but um, is it better to leave swallowtail caterpillars for the birds or protect them? In other words, should I think what they're asking is, should we be bringing them inside and raising them? Um, kind of like we do with monarchs a lot of times. Um, well, first of all, you don't need to leave, bring the monarchs in to protect them from the birds. They are bright, all those brightly colored caterpillars are somewhat toxic. And in the case of monarchs, what they're doing, the way they deal with the toxins in the milkweed is they just store them in their bodies. And that bright coloration is an indication to the birds that you shouldn't eat me. And they have developed a lot of natural defenses. It's usually when they're really small and frequently their natural defense is to look like bird poop uh, that they're going to be more susceptible. But for the swallowtails particularly, once they get to be uh, a second or a third or a third in star, they're usually too big for the birds to eat. That's one of the, is the issues with climate change is it's changing that phenology of when the birds are eating and when the caterpillars are the right size to be eaten. Because, you know, they start off, they're too small to be worth uh, bothering with, and then they can, some of them can get too big to eat. So I would say no, you know, the, the, the birds and the caterpillars have been getting along for thousands of years on their own with they don't really need our support yep as i said it's it's a bit of an opinion thing because i always bring my monarchs inside to raise them but that's because their survival rate is so low and um, their species is struggling so much i feel like any help they can get because <laughs> their survival rate with also, me is 10, like they uh, said pretty, this is 100 sharing this space and it's kind of cool to raise your own monarchs in in the house yep um, one last question before we move on. Um, this is a um, one about a community garden. It says we try to maximize using space by rotating crops quickly to cover crops. And um, I'm going to butcher this word, brassicas in um, fall. So completely different plants are in ground space. Is there a different way to protect uh, to support bug growth in this context when we can't really leave all the stems in place for two years? Um, well, like I said, you don't have to do everything in every spot. So as long as you are supporting your pollinators with native plants, because uh, most of the stuff we grow in, you know, the food crops are not native. And if I'm not mistaken, brassicas is, um, that's the wild version of our crucif cruciferous vegetables, which are not native to North America. Um, so yeah, I mean, as long as you've got a flower garden nearby where you're leaving those stems, they can use that for overwintering. Not every piece of ground has to be devoted just to that. Well, thank you so much, Jim. Um, I'm going to go ahead and move on to our uh, next speaker, Tim O'Weiler okay. with the Extension Service. Um, and again, if you have any other follow-up questions for Jim, feel free to uh, 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 visit the link we're going to send you and you can get his contact information. But Tim is going to present to us on solutions to challenging soils and locations. Take it away, Tim. Thank you very much. Um, it's always good to partner with uh, PEC on this event. They do a really good job of um, running a great professional event to share some, some good information with our communities. Um, so I wanted to just talk a little bit about some trees today, and I wanted to kind of address this problem a little bit that um, you know, where our trees grow are out in the forests and the woods and um, where we try to grow them often is in these little holes in our concrete world. Um, this is actually a photo taken at uh, Tyson's Corner Mall up in Vienna. So, um, and that 
cherry tree was doing remarkably well there. So, but not, you know, not the best site for a tree. So anyway, when we're in a urban environment and I use the word urban, but it can certainly refer to the spaces around our homes and things where we're, we have more pavement and more buildings and all of those things, more roads. So we, we usually have more compacted soils because we're having to drive things over them on occasion, or we may have to, um, you know, the things, get, you know, a lawnmower gets driven, things get driven over our soils quite often. Um, oftentimes we have a less soil for um, roots to explore. So you can see that in this picture in Warrington, there's, um, you know, not as much space for roots to grow into because of all of the space taken up by asphalt and sidewalks and gutters um, and things like that. So these, this is also droughty conditions and hotter sites. We get obviously the asphalt and everything is reflecting heat in the summer. Sometimes these are flooded or wet sites because water is diverted into certain locations when storms come. Um, these trees and plants often have to deal with, with um, salt because people are putting this out to melt snow and things in the winter. Um, the pH of these soils is often higher than our native soils, and that's for a couple of different reasons. One is that um, we often put lime in our soils to get our turf grass to do really well in these situations, and so we've raised the pH. And then um, concrete also uh, will over time tend to raise the pH of the soils around it just a little bit. Um, so uh, we want these trees that are around our homes and around our vehicles to have a good strong branch structure so that if we have a storm, they don't break apart. We don't want the roots to damage sidewalks and driveways. Um, we want these trees to compete with turf usually fairly well. Um, and we want them to be deer resistant and resistant to some other pests in our environment so that um, we can enjoy them from year to year. So these are, these are a lot of the challenges. Most of them are unique to an urban environment. Some of them just happen out in the woods too. So um, there are certain tree species that are better adapted at managing this. Um, and Virginia Tech has this urban tree finder tool, which is helpful at figuring out which trees might be best in your environment. And so um, there's, there's a couple of different pieces on this site, but um, you can do this. Step one is to kind of do a site assessment of any place you're considering planting a tree, whether it be in your yard or in a community, a community space like a park or something like that. Um, and then once you do an assessment where you're looking at things like what might the soil be like, would it be, might it be extra wet or um, what the soil texture might be like, things like that. Um, then you can do the second step, step where you search for different trees that would be uh, appropriate for that site. And in some of our urban soils, we might even look at modifying something about the site to make it more appropriate for having um, a tree there. I wanted to just focus on the step two section of this website. So I'm gonna go one slide forward and that's what I've clicked on to see what you're gonna see next is just this step two. So it takes you to this um, web page that has lots of different options to it um, where you can select the certain features that you want out of a tree. You might select how big you want it to get or how dense the foliage you want it to be, or if you want it to be evergreen or deciduous. And then you can scroll down further. And so as I slide it, I advance my slide, that's what you're looking at. This is the bottom of that tree that was above earlier. Um, and if you don't know something in this question, you can just leave it blank. If you don't know what size tree you want, or if you're unsure if you want a deciduous or an evergreen, you can just leave that blank. And, and then the the, um, the tool will give you more options. So um, you can select which, um, how well drained your site is or how compacted the soils are. Um, 
if you know something about the rooting area, you know, if, if there's a lots of sidewalks and things around, then there's less rooting area for that tree to get to. Um, this top little triangle is about the soils, about the percentage of sand, silt, and clay that are in your soils, and that might be kind of hard to determine. Um, but if you've got lots of clay in your soil, maybe you want to select this top triangle. Um, that would be our most clay soils. Um, and you can just try different options out and see what happens after you, after you click different fields in here. And so I went through this tool and I selected a few different fields and I selected I wanted a tree with a moderate crown density. That means that the shade underneath it would be moderate, not really heavy shade and not a lighter shade. I think they had three choices on that one. I said I wanted a deciduous tree. I said I had an uncompacted soil. I had a moderate drainage, which was the middle area. So there was some drainage problems in some of my soil and that I'm in the Piedmont of Virginia. I skipped the height and width, I skipped the soil texture, and I skipped the rooting area. Um, and so when I did all that, this was the first part of the options that came up for me using this tool. And so um, they had a, a bald cypress, which is, you know, would be a, a rather large tree, a crepe myrtle. Um, so that it does have non-native trees in here as well. Um, and then, you know, some of our a linden, our elm hybrids, a hardy rubber tree. Anyway, and you can scroll down. I just cut this off so that it would fit on this slide. Um, and but you can go back and forth and try different things. And but this is recommending some trees that would likely do well in the site that I delineated, where we don't have a real problem with compacted soil, but we do have some drainage issues, um, and we want a deciduous and that that, that shade level. So. Um, there are lots of these tools out there that will help you find plants that might be suitable for your situation. So I'm going to advance one slide more and show you some other tools that are out there. Um, the one from Virginia Tech is specifically targeted at trees, but something like the Missouri Botanical Gardens Plant Finder um, will have, you know, shrubs and herbaceous plants as well. So you could put, you know, what type of soil you have or what shade level you have in an area and it would, it would give you other options. Um, the Lady Bird Johnson Wildlife Center um, also has a plant search tool. Um, so you could check that out. And uh, a lo another local government uh, resource would be the Virginia Department of Conservation and Recreation uh, Native Plant Finder tool. So if, you know, I find that sometimes I've, I have this spot in my garden and I'm, I think, oh, what could I put there? And maybe I've tried something and it didn't do well. And I know that I've got, oh, I've got this challenge. It's, it's really droughty there, but it's also really shady there, or something like that. And you can put those conditions in these plant finders and you might, and will help give you options of what might do well in different situations. I've sent all of these resources to Julie and she'll put them together in the resource guide for you all. So now is a great time to be planting trees now in the fall and all of our woody plants, this is a great time to plant. So um, I'm gonna advocate for planting a tree. Um, I really like planting small and bare root trees and I'll show you some reasons why going forward, but um, you know, there's some some examples, and I know sometimes it's really hard to to think of. Oh, I I'm planting this small tree that's maybe less than two feet tall, and um, and think of it ever getting some size. But it it is an investment in the future, um, and it's part of our you know it's part of the ecosystem services that Jim's talked about earlier um, as those trees age and mature in in their space. So I wanted to share this photo with you all. This is, a, this is actually a tree that I planted in my garden a couple of years ago. And I was so excited about it and went to the nursery and bought it. And um, I knew that this problem of circling roots was a problem. And so, you know, I made an effort to cut the roots and um, depending on where your stuff is on your screen, I had to move a few things so I could see this, but this was the outer rim of my pot was clear out here. 
And you can see that these little roots that are turning had hit the pot and they, I had cut them because I knew this was an issue. And so, but what I didn't know is that inside the soil and, and the media that was in my pot, there was another two pots that ha that tree had been planted in at different points in its life. And this tree lived about a year and a half in my garden before it died. And then I said, I think there was a root problem and I dug it up and lo and behold, there were, there were lots of root problems. So, you know, I think even if I would have pulled all of the soil off of this tree when it was being planted and cut all those roots, there was just too much of a, too much of an issue here. It had had too many girdling roots and too many large girdling roots over the years to address this. So, um, you know, even pulling that soil off the root ball, some trees do that fairly well. Some trees really don't tolerate that well. And so, um, you know, that just, it's, this unfortunately was a tree that was not bound to live once it was planted. So if you do really want to plant a larger tree um, and you, you can't uh, plant one of those bare root seedlings, I would recommend planting a bald and burlap tree. Tends to be a little bit less of those root problems with a bald and burlap tree. Um, the real downside of planting a bald and burlap tree, though, it certainly is the fact that you've lost maybe as much as 80% of the root mass of that tree when it's been dug out of the field. Um, so it can, you know, realize that those trees are stressed that first year or two while they're reestablishing their root system. I wanted to talk about five of my favorite trees that are planted in an urban environment. So that's what I'm going to uh, highlight next. Um, so this, this is one of my favorites that I've discovered in the last few years and hadn't grown much before, but um, this is a our hop hornbeam. It's a native tree that is native from, um, you know, the deep south all the way up to the Great Lakes area. Um, it's a fairly small tree growing to maybe 30 feet tall or so. Often it's multi-trunked. This one here is an example that's single trunk. It has dark green kind of elm-shaped leaves um, and these little flowers that uh, look like a hop which is where it gets its name. Um, does really well in dry sites, does really well kind of as a street tree, is and just tolerates the urban conditions that we put trees through really well. Um, so that's why it made my list. And I will say these are in no particular order. Um, for a flowering tree, I really like the yellow wood. Um, this is a spring flowering, like kind of late spring flowering tree, has a, these white pendulous blooms on them. Um, it tolerates a higher pH soil um, and it can tolerate compacted soils. It transplants really well. So, you know, some of these things that are really important for a tree to be able to do uh, if we're going to plant it in a landscape or in a park or something. it, it fills some of those needs. One downside of this is that it tends to have a fairly um, poor branch structure when it grows out in the open like this, uh, especially during its, when it's young. Um, and so it can be susceptible to storm and ice damage. If you, if you prune and, and structure prune that a little bit when it's younger um, or hire an arborist to come in and do that um, for a younger tree, that can really help solve some of those problems so that it's not as likely to break apart in a storm or cause a problem going forward. And I would call this a medium sized tree. It's going to start out fairly small, but with age, I remember seeing one at, um, I think it's called Gypsy Hill Park in Stanton, Virginia, which is down in the valley, had just a huge tree, probably 50, 55, 60 feet tall. Um, so they are capable of getting quite large, but it will take them some time to do it. I tried to throw in one evergreen, and this is the one I decided to throw in. So our American holly, Ilex opatia, um, tends to be fairly deer resistant. Um, it's a plant that you can plant out in full sun or full shade, so that's nice. Um, 
it does like a little lower pH soil. So if you've got those higher pH soils or you need to figure that out, you can do a soil test and, and figure that out. Um, it can be a medium sized tree uh, or it can be a small shrub. There are cultivars out there now that they've pruned and um, worked with that are, you know, just like small shrubs, four or five feet tall. Um, so much smaller than the, uh, than the species. Um, it also tolerates pruning well. So if you wanted something to be a hedge or something like that, this is an option and it also transplants well. So there's some definitely some good things going for our Native American holly. Um, the bees and the pollinators like it. And then it's got these berries for uh, our winter food for some of our birds as well. Uh, bald cypress is another tree that's not native to, you know, the Piedmont of Virginia, certainly, but is, is native to areas of the deep south and coastal south, um, but certainly does really well in our part of the world. Um, it tolerates the dry soils as well as really wet soils that, you know, we think of it growing in the water and right along the edge of a, a river or, or a, a pond or something, but it will handle really a dry site very well. Also, many of our urban trees do handle really dry sites well because they grow along wet stream banks or that may be intermittent, that they may dry out from time to time and they need to be able to handle those times when the stream stops flowing. Um, bald cypress is a deciduous conifer and it has this bright green foliage in the summer and then the fall color is what you see on the left. It tends to be a fairly upright tree um, kind of pyramidal in shape, although there are cultivars such as a, um, a weeping bald cypress and other things out there as well. This is one of my favorite trees. It tends to be widely used in the landscape um, and for areas to our south, you know, if you go down to North Carolina, this is, I would say, almost an overused tree. Um, but it's just incredibly tolerant of urban conditions. It's one of those trees that can survive in a parking lot island. Um, it tolerates really hot, dry sites and compacted soils. It has these small, narrow leaves and it's really easy to transplant. And so um, if you're looking for a large tree to handle a site that doesn't have a lot of soil available or something like that, this is just one of those few um, tree species out there that would fit into such a site. I did want to share one more resource that we have locally here in Warrington, which is the Arboretum at Rady Park. Um, the Arboretum uh, is home to 70, more than 70 underutilized trees and shrubs. Um, so you folks can come and take a look and see what they might want to add to their landscape and what they look like growing in the environment. Um, the Arboretum was founded in 1999 by Extension Master Gardeners and has been maintained since then. So um, some of those trees are, you know, now with over 20 years of growth on them are certainly getting some size to them. So that address there is where it's located and my contact information is there as well. So thank you all for letting me share and I'll turn this back to Julie. Thank you so much, Tim. Um, so we've got uh, several questions for you. Hopefully we can get to all of them. Um, the first one um, is about uh, the, the plant finder. Um, people were wondering if there was any option to search for natives or to somehow um, separate out natives from other cultivars. So in the Virginia Tech urban tree finder, there was not a selection for natives. So if that was important to, to you, you need to just self-select that at the end. Or, or and, and if you don't know, do a little research to figure out if what you're looking at is native or, you know, native to your region of wherever you live or wherever. Yeah, maybe use it in combination with the Lady Bird Johnson website or the Missouri um, Native Plant Finder. Um, another question was about um, how can a, a tree safely be bald and burlapped uh, prior to planting? Oh, sorry, my thing just scrolled down on me. Um, Prior to planting, where was it? 
Okay, um, sorry, it's so hard to know when a tree was dug up when, when buying from a nursery. Yeah, so I mean, I, I guess I would just recommend developing a relationship with the, the nursery that you work with um, and maybe find a smaller nursery that that's easier to develop a relationship with them. You know, usually the retail nursery is not the person who actually did the growing. Um, and so they're, you know, they're serving as a, a middleman, um, but asking questions about where this tree was grown, how it was grown, when it was dug, you know, what the, the root ball ratio size is compared to the caliper of the trunk of the tree that's being planted. Some of those kinds of things can just give you clues. You know, in a really good nursery, a bald and burlap nursery may actually be going in and root pruning a year or two ahead of time before they dig the tree so that it encourages more fibrous roots closer to the center of the plant root ball. And kind of to follow up on that one, someone also asked if you had any specific recommendations for Virginia nurseries um, that do a good job managing the health of the roots of their trees and shrubs. Oh, I'm just gonna say I'm gonna I'm gonna say no to that one. I'm just gonna say do your research and find your you know ask your questions. Do you know there's lots of local nurseries growing good good plant material, um, and I would just recommend asking asking some good questions. And you because you've been here today, you've learned some good questions to ask. Yeah, exactly. And I know that we have. Um, a resource. I think Marco may have included a link to it at the beginning of the chat. Um, so that, that gives you some local nurseries to check out. Um, last question um, was about yellow wood um, and, and where is it native in Virginia? So I'm not sure that yellow wood is native to Virginia exactly. It's kind of has a spotty distribution, which tends to be um, in Tennessee and Kentucky, maybe Southern Indiana. Um, it, it doesn't have a, a real wide native range, but it had a, when I looked actually by chance, looked up the native range of this one right before I popped on today. Um, and it may not be a Virginia native, but it's certainly an Eastern uh, North American native. All right, and then one last question. Um, do you have any advice about um, improving the survival rate of root bound trees? You know what I've tried to do at home, <laughs> I guess, is just look at it as a two or three year project where I'm going to, if I realize I've planted a root bound tree or that was the only way I could get the species of tree I wanted or something like that, then I just, um, I may cut some roots at planting and then I plan to go back and I'm gonna um, do some root excavation in year two, three, maybe four and prune any roots I find that are circling or girdling. Um, and so, you know, obviously a, a parks and record department or a city or town's never gonna do anything like that, but maybe in a residential situation with your own home garden, you could do that. Well, thank you so much, Tim. Um, really appreciate it. Our last presenter today is uh, David Wood, and he's going to be speaking to us about building your own rain garden. Um, and again, he's with the um, Chesapeake Stormwater Network. Great. Thanks, Julie. Um, appreciate the opportunity to, to be here today and to talk with you all. Um, what I'm going to do is I'll walk through sort of the basic steps to designing and building and finding a good location for a rain garden on your property. Uh, I'll also provide a lot of resources and tools at the end. Um, there's a, a lot of steps involved and I, I probably won't be able to, to provide a ton of detail on, on each of those, but there are lots of resources where you can kind of go in and take a deeper dive if you are getting ready to actually go in and, and do some planting. So um, I'll go ahead and, and get started. Um, first, just a, a quick word about um, CSN and sort of where where I get my uh, background in telling you how to, to build a rain garden. Um, we're a small nonprofit organization. We do trainings and, and webcasts like this um, uh, around stormwater applications uh, in particular. So ways of treating runoff, um, both in residential properties as well as working with local governments to, to try and improve their practices as well. 
So I'll just get started and, and say that, you know, for those of you who maybe aren't as familiar with rain gardens in particular, um, they are a stormwater um, focused landscaping practice where essentially you design your garden uh, to have a, a slight depression um, in order to capture and, and pond runoff and rainwater, um, largely from, you know, your driveway or your rooftop, or your downspouts and things like that. The other really important thing is that they have a a mixed soil type that allows the water to you know, infiltrate into the ground rather than running off uh, surfaces where they might be picking up uh, things like fertilizers or pesticides or you know, other things that are on those impervious surfaces. So there are different ways that you can design them, um, but generally any, any rain garden is going to you know, direct the water flow from your impervious surface. Um, you can have that done either through you know, overland flow, you know, just kind of across the, the yard, you can even bury a, a downspout pipe uh, that, that discharges right into your rain garden if you prefer. Um, then you have this slight depression, this ponding depth with your rain garden mixture, um, and, then, and then the plants, of course. So when you're thinking about building your rain garden, uh, the first thing is to really think about, um, you know, being a, a downspout detective, right, and figuring out where the water is coming from on your property and where are the opportunities um, to place a rain garden. So in the three different examples here, you're kind of looking at where the downspouts are located in these three um, <laughs> very 90s photos. Um, but, you know, these instances are still the case. And in the photo to the left, you actually have a downspout that is buried in the lawn and discharging all the way out directly to the street. Um, you could put a rain garden uh, in this location. You would just have to be a bit more creative. Uh, probably involves, you know, digging up uh, that pipe that is buried under the ground or cutting it off uh, above ground against the building and redirecting it to your rain garden and the lawn. The middle photo is probably not a good candidate for a rain garden. Obviously, there is no grass there to do your digging. Uh, something like a, a rain barrel uh, might be a better fit. There are also raised planter boxes that you could consider that are designed like a rain garden, um, but sit fully above the ground. Uh, and then, of course, the, the case to the right is sort of a, a classic example of a good location for a rain garden where you have your downspout discharging to a grassy area um, with, with plenty of room to, to plant. Related to that first step, um, it's really important to figure out the other plumbing on your site, especially if you are in a suburban or uh, somewhat urbanized area. But, it, but even if you're not, you need to, before you dig to the depths that you're gonna be digging um, for this type of a garden, you should definitely uh, contact your utility providers. So in Virginia, uh, it's 811, um, you can call, or, or there's a website now where you can go and, and have someone come out and mark all your utility lines, things like sewer, water, natural gas, um, any sort of underground cables. Obviously, that's a major safety issue, um, certainly going to impact where you're going to be able to put your uh, rain garden. So make sure you do that as, as part of the first steps before you break ground. Also related to location, just a quick word about um, <clears throat> shady rain gardens, uh, trees in particular. Um, while you will probably also struggle to get good uh, plant growth, depending on species when you're planting under the canopy, uh, it's also generally good to not dig um, due to impacts on roots within sort of the, the drip line or the canopy uh, of your tree. So a, a good rule of thumb <clears throat> is one and a quarter feet of protected area um, in terms of the radius for every inch of trunk diameter. So in the example on the screen, you've got a 12 inch trunk diameter. So you wanna make sure you at least have a radius of, of 15 feet around that trunk uh, that you don't wanna be digging. A larger area is even better uh, if you can afford it, if you have a larger um, area in, in place. And, and again, that's just to, to largely protect your, your trees that are already in place there. It's also gonna be a huge pain for you digging if you constantly are hitting root zones. All right, so you've got um, some ideas about where you want to place your rain garden. So now you want to make sure that you can actually infiltrate or, or get that water, that runoff to soak into the ground in the location that you've chosen. So you want to measure your infiltration rate. Um, this is particularly important in developments, um, new developments where the soils might be really compacted. Uh, we have seen plenty of instances um, in new developments in particular where just all of the heavy machinery operating during construction really compacts the soils, uh, you know, several inches or, or even feet below the surface. 
And so once you build your rain garden, you might seem fine uh, at the outset, but if there's that compact lens uh, underground, your water is eventually going to back up and you're just going to end up with a small pond uh, in your yard. So this is an important step to make sure that you can infiltrate this water. So you can take a post hole digger or something like that. Uh, you're looking for a hole about 18 to 24 inches deep, um, filling up a, a bucket with water and uh, pouring it into the hole. And then basically you're just timing it to see how long it takes for that water to drain out of the hole or, or if it drains at all. Um, there are some Tips for what you're looking for in terms of the infiltration rate. Uh, we try to make it easy and, and provide the math for you. Um, there's a, a quick you know, calculation that you can do. So if you, you have a 24 inch hole, you can just mark your start time and the time it takes to fully empty the hole, the number of hours that it takes to drain. Generally, um, if you have anything better than a half inch per hour, uh, you're gonna be okay. If you are getting less than half an inch per hour, you're going to need either a bigger rain garden or you might want to consider uh, other practices um, in, in that location. There are some techniques if you're really um, set on a rain garden, you can uh, dig under drains where you have like a pipe that can discharge excess water um, out through the low point of the garden um, if you have trouble um, but really want to locate something there, uh, but that's a little bit more of a complicated uh, process. As far as sizing your rain garden, again, uh, we have these tools that can help you do it a little bit more easily by inputting your uh, site conditions. Basically, it's, it's an equation that is based on the contributing rooftop area uh, for your, your site. So generally speaking, um, most of these rain gardens are going to be about 50 to 150 square feet in surface area. Um, you can do it with a, a quick and dirty method if you just know the general square footage of your, you know, total roof, uh, assuming you're, you're doing a drown, downspout here. Um, you could also break it up by the area. So in, in the photo on the screen, say you have a downspout at the upper right hand corner um, that drains that, you know, red roof area there. So you can say that you've got your roof area, your downspout, um, and that gives you the area draining to your rain garden. And then you just multiply that by a factor. It's, it's 0.12 uh, is the, the engineering factor. Um, you don't have to think much about that. That's just uh, baked into the calculation. It'll tell you the square footage um, for your rain garden that you need to aim for. Again, if you have a bad infiltration rate, you might want to go a little bit bigger. Um, if you don't have as much room as you need, sometimes you can get away with it. You just have to know that your rain garden is probably going to be pretty wet most of the time. It's going to be, you know, what they call a wet footed uh, rain garden. And, and you might want to think about that in terms of your plant selection down the line. So I'll show you an example of this. Um, but after you sort of have your location, you have your, um, your size, you know, determined for your rain garden, you have to figure out what kind of materials that you need. So again, I mentioned that one of the really important parts of a rain garden is making sure you have the right soil mixture um, so that you have the water that sits long enough but also moves through the soil. Um, that'll pull out any uh, pollutants and things like that as it infiltrates uh, through those soils, things like nitrogen and, and sediment um, that, that might be running off uh, into your rain garden. And so basically you have these yellow fields in this form. And, and again, I, I'll say this one more time. We have these tools that are, are linked at the end of the presentation if you want to use them. Um, but you input your, your digging depth, your ponding depth, your topsoil and subsoils, and then the number of inlets that you're calculating. And it'll tell you things like how much mulch you need, uh, how much sand you need to mix in with your soil to get that nice you know, porous soil that'll infiltrate. Um, through the, the grass. So um, basically, if you put in, in this example, you have a 24-inch digging depth, six inches of ponding, uh, and then, you know, you, you take a look at your soils and you have maybe six inches of that kind of nice, dark, uh, you know, organic soil with your sod and things like that. And after that, you've got what we call like subsoil, which is typically more clay, you know, not as, not as nice soil there. 18 inches of that for a 64-square-foot garden. So the calculator will tell you, you know, once you put all of that into those blue cells, that you'll need about 11 wheelbarrows worth of soil to get rid of. Um, so just have a plan for how you want to dispose of that. If you have, you know, holes or depressions around your property, um, if you want to spread it somewhere, keeping in mind that a lot of that is going to be that subsoil 
uh, that is not great for growing things in. So um, you'll probably need to add some amendments if you do want to kind of use it for a garden somewhere else or something like that. Uh, similarly, you'll need a, a cubic yard of, of mulch and three tons worth of sand, uh, you know, maybe two and a half for, for backfilling the garden. Um, this also addresses inlets to the garden. So if you choose not to, for instance, bury a, a storm drain pipe that will discharge directly into the garden, but instead you want sort of a swale feature or a river rock kind of feature um, to carry water from the downspout or your impervious surface to your rain garden. Uh, this accounts for about how much stone uh, you would need to you know, properly design an inlet for that garden or a place where the water is gonna enter your garden. There's a lot of steps on this page. I'll go through them pretty quickly uh, and focus mostly just kind of on tips for um, you know, managing this part of the project. This is the actual construction of your rain garden. So you've got all your materials, you've got your planning done, you're ready to build or to dig. Um, it, it's a lot of labor. It's a, a labor of love when you get to this point because depending on the size of your garden, you know, if you're digging down you know, 18 to 24 inches deep across the 64, um, you know, square foot area. It's a, a pretty good size uh, garden. So, you know, I recommend um, this two tarp method when you're doing your digging. Um, one of the tarps is great for your good soils, your top soils. So, you know, as you kind of go around and dig, you know, maybe about six inches deep, um, you have your tarp sitting there you take that first upper level off and place it on your one tarp. That's all your really good topsoil with good organic material. You can use that to backfill into your garden with your sand mixture. The other tarp uh, can be used to separate out that subsoil, the stuff that you're probably gonna end up wasting uh, somewhere else on the property or, or whatever. Um, so if you are on a slope, uh, you might want to have a berm uh, on the downhill slide to get in to get a little bit of additional ponding. Um, even if you're not, if you're you know a little bit short on depth, you can can use a little pond or berm to create a little bit more ponding depth using that bad soil that you have. If you have some some to use there, um, when you're backfilling, uh, as you do your digging, you've got your hole fully dug out at this point. You're essentially looking for a one to one mix with your sand that you've ordered and that good topsoil that you've set aside. Um, on your first tarp. So, you know, you can put a shovel full of sand, shovel full of soil, shovel full of sand, shovel full of soil. Um, if you have a little bit more sand than you have topsoil, that's fine. Um, it's okay to be a little bit more in that direction. Uh, you just want to make sure that that, you know, rain garden is going to be able to drain nicely. I'll also just mention mulch. Uh, this guidance sort of recommends a little bit of mulch. It, it's pretty common practice for rain gardens and, and really all landscaping. There are other models. Um, there has recently kind of been a movement towards using more, um, you know, ground cover uh, types of species in your rain gardens instead of mulch. Uh, mulch has a tendency to move during large rain events that you're piping in or, or directing to your rain garden. Uh, so it can lead to some more maintenance if you um, are really mulch heavy. That said, it's a good suppressant. Um, the alternative model kind of relies on having a, you know, a few years of hard work to kind of get a good ground cover established that will hold all of your soils in place and things like that. Um, but it, it's sort of an aesthetic preference a little bit as well. Um, you know, I have mulch in a lot of my garden beds around my house, so it's, it's not necessarily a no-no, um, but it's just something to think about. There's some good uh, works on, on sort of the benefits of ground cover. And then as far as, <clears throat> you know, after you have uh, finished filling in, you know, I didn't spend any time on the plants here. Um, I'll probably defer to you know, folks like Jim and, and Tim to kind of give you better information about plants. I'm more of a stormwater guy. I deal with the engineering and things like that. Um, we, there are lots of great resources out there about finding plants and I'll show a couple um, in just a minute. Uh, but you know, the thing to keep in mind with your planting is these rain gardens are gonna have sort of zones of, of wetness. You know, the bottom of your rain garden is gonna be pretty wet. A lot of the times uh, your slopes and your banks, you know, maybe there's some small benches and things like that where the plants that you're selecting are gonna be more tolerant of drier conditions. 
Um, you just also have to think about the fact that these rain gardens are designed to hold a lot of water for a short period of time and then drain pretty effectively. So it's a lot about extreme conditions, um, wet and dry. So, you know, once you have it planted, you've got your maintenance, um, you know, you're watering your rain garden uh, at the beginning to help it get established. If you don't have a lot of rainy conditions, uh, you are planting mostly wet tolerant plants. Um, you'll probably need some, some early weeding, uh, you know, in the winter and early second season, growing season, you can cut back your, your perennials, or in some cases you can leave them as, you know, we heard from Jim earlier to create some good habitat conditions. Um, if you have mulch, rake those out, make sure your gutters and downspouts are, are not clogging. Um, and then from there, you're just rolling, you know, some of these can get pretty bushy uh, in future years, depending on the types of species that you plant. Uh, so it's just kind of maintaining an aesthetic that you prefer um, in terms of how those the spread, you know, replacing, maybe splitting some plants and sharing them with neighbors and, and whatnot. So I'll just wrap up. Um, I have a bunch of slides here. I won't go through each and every resource, um, but we will make these available to you. For folks that like kind of watching, doing visuals like this, we do have another webcast uh, on homeowner stormwater practices aside from just rain gardens. Um, Maryland Sea Grant and Penn State also have great webinars on planting and installing rain gardens that I would recommend if you want to get a second opinion um, from someone other than me. Uh, we also have, for the folks that prefer kind of a guide, uh, all of these resources that I talked about today in terms of the spreadsheets and the step-by-step the -step tools are in that CSN Homeowner's Guide for a Bay-Friendly Property um, link. Again, there's also resources from Maryland and some other places. For plants, um, I mentioned that, you know, we're not the plant people. So, you know, some that we like and have used the Alliance for the Bay has a native plants for rain gardens guide. Fish and Wildlife Service also has some native plant guides as well as the resources you've heard about earlier today. Uh, plant Virginia Natives is another good native plant guide uh, for you all. A few resources on if you're looking for seeds for rain gardens, a, a few places where you can find those based on what your needs are, um, as well as some different repositories that list out local plant nurseries. Um, these aren't recommendations or more places where you can learn about who is in your area. Um, and then homeowner assistance programs. For those of you in Virginia, uh, which I think is most of you, the VCAP program, the Virginia Conservation Assistance Program can provide some cost sharing um, as long as that they have funding available where sometimes they can help subsidize up to 50% of the cost of a rain garden planting. Um, so if you're interested in that, there's a link to that program uh, there as well. And then finally, uh, if you are looking for someone else to do the design and installation, uh, there is a program, the Chesapeake Bay Landscaping Professionals uh, Certification Program. Uh, they have a really great program where they train folks in uh, these practices and uh, they have a, a directory where you can search for providers in your area that have been certified as Chesapeake Bay landscape professionals um, to make sure that you kind of get good quality and, and folks that know what they're talking about from a sustainability um, perspective, if that's one of the goals in your planting program. So that's all I have. Um, thanks, Julie. I'll turn it back to you and, and happy to take any questions. Well, thank you very much. That was a great presentation. Um, but the question I had, actually, the first question is, those forms that you were using looked what looked extremely helpful. Um, are those going to be made available? Yes. So those are um, provided in that homeowner's guide um, to a Bay-friendly property. Uh, I will double check and make sure that the actual fillable forms are in there. Um, if not, I will send those over to you, Julie, and we can make sure that those get out to everybody. Okay, awesome. And then we had um, one question about infiltration rate. Is that the same, or is that unlike percolate, per percolation rate, or is it the same thing? Basically the same thing. Yeah, there are different methods for, for how you can do it. Ours is just a, a, you know, easy, you know, all you need is a bucket and a post hole digger to kind of figure it out, um, you know, so... But yes, basically the same thing. You want to make sure that your site is, is you know, can drain, the soils can drain um, at that location. Otherwise, like I said, you'll end up with a small pond in, in your yard. Gotcha. And then um, one other person asked, with this kind of um, garden, um, do you have to water it during drought conditions? 
Yeah, so Jim had a, a great point there. Um, yeah, even just like any garden, uh, you will need to keep your plants happy and watered. Um, you know, it's one of the, the difficulties when you're planting them in sort of a, you know, urban streetscape type of environment or whatever, they don't always get the watering that they need and they can get pretty dry. Um, generally, they'll stay wet enough um, if you have, you know, a good period of rain. But yeah, if you've got a couple of weeks, you should definitely plan to get some water to those plants. And just from my own experience, I'll, I'll just share if it's helpful to anyone else. Um, I actually tried to establish a rain garden beside my house. Um, it was the back of my house and I had a basement. Didn't really think about, I mean, it, it sloped down away from the house. So I didn't really think, oh, it's going to flow back towards my basement and cause any problems. But it did, <laughs> which um, was not, not a huge problem. I just redirected the water and the water stopped seeping through the walls because it wasn't like a foundation crack or anything. So I was able to just redirect the water and then it stopped seeping in. But um, you know, you, you should also consider uh, or at least be aware of the foundation of your house and any other, um, you know, things like that when you're putting these sort of things in. Yeah, absolutely. Um, generally, it's probably good practice to try to plant it about 10 feet away from your house um, so that you don't have those issues. Uh, you know, the flip side is sometimes they're great if you have basement flooding issues, you can redirect some of that water to a rain garden, you know, a few feet away from, from the property and you've solved a flooding issue. But yeah, if you put it too close, you can definitely have issues with that. One of the other things that comes up a lot is people ask about um, liners for the, the bottoms of the, the gardens. Those are not a good idea um, just because they tend to clog really easily. The really fine particles and things like that will work their way into the liners over time. And uh, you just have created a pool um, at, at that point. So generally speaking, you know, you can maybe put some on the side slopes if you need to help, you know, stabilize something or, or whatever, but certainly not in the bottom of a rain garden. You wouldn't want to put any sort of matting or liner there. Um, All right. Well, thank you so much, David. And we have a few more minutes and there was a couple questions that I'm honestly not sure which one of you could answer, but I'm gonna throw them out and any of you who are able to answer them, please feel free to chime in. Um, but we had a question about um, mounding, <laughs> wrote it down here somewhere, ah, here we go. Um, mound gardens, um, a, a homeowner has a plethora of fallen trees and tree stumps and was wondering what, what we think of mound gardens, and they also put this other word I've never seen before, huggle culture. <laughs> so if that rings a bell with anyone. <laughs> no takers on mound garden gardening? Well, I mean, you know, if you're building a garden on top of um, a log or something like that, you got to recognize that logs are going to decompose, so you're going to get settling. On the other hand, as the log is decomposing, it's also putting a lot of good stuff into your soil. So as long as you've got the rooting space, it's, it's not a horrible idea. Um, certainly better than landscape lasagna, or the landscape lasagna gardening where you're putting down cardboard and gardening on top of it. That's a really, really bad idea. All right. All right. I'll also just add, Julie, we've seen from a stormwater perspective, we've seen the hugel culture approach taken on sloped properties to create some uh, gradient breaks to kind of berm and pool and sort of let water coming down a hill sort of filter through those raised bed berms and things like that. Um, I would have, I haven't followed up on some of those projects, but they were kind of interesting applications and ways of sort of creating almost like a step pool type of system, but not a, an engineered step pool um, to try to, to move water uh, a little bit slower down a, a steep slope. Nice. All right. Cool ideas. Um, one of the other questions, this is a little bit more technical, probably for Jim, uh, was uh, someone had mentioned during your presentation that 80, that you mentioned 80 to 90% of the local ecotype, um, uh, that you had mentioned 80 to 90% local ecotype plants, which is higher than 70% that they had heard before. And they were wondering if there's new research um, as to why it should be 80 to 90% versus 70%. Uh, well, what I said was locally native, um, not necessarily local ecotype. Um, 
I'm still kind of on the fence about that. When it comes to trees, I believe in reaching for further south for stock that's going to be better adapted to the conditions we're likely to see when those trees become mature. And that's one of the issues with urban forestry is, um, you know, do you plant the trees that we know are gonna to survive today or do we plant the trees we think will survive in 30 or 40 years when they're mature? Um, as far as the numbers that I gave, I may have misre misremembered what I had, had read or said, but I do know in the, uh, the chickadee study, it was 75% or 70% was the break uh, even study. And of course it doesn't hurt to have much more than 70%. And contrary to what a lot of people think, we've got a lot of really beautiful native plants. Um, we got a lot of really ugly native, native plants also. But when you go to Asia and Europe where we're getting these non-native plants, they got a lot of ugly plants there too. They just don't bother importing them. So they're only bringing the really beautiful stuff from those places. I agree, <clears throat> I love our native plants. Um, one other question um, was about uh, mulching with cardboard. You had mentioned, Jim, uh, that it's much better than uh, doing this um, spaghetti mulching or sheep mulching with cardboard. Can you explain that a little further? Uh, yeah, cardboard, newspaper, landscape fabric, plastic, all of that creates a water and vapor barrier on top of your soils. So not only is it smothering the plants you're trying to get rid of, it's also smothering your soil ecosystem. Um, and cardboard particularly is designed to shed water. That's why we make shipping boxes out of it. Um, so a lot of the research we've been looking at um, the best thing to mulch with is arborist wood chips. Those things that just go through the chipper once. Uh, and that gets to David's comment about the mulch floating is you got a lot more wood in there and wood is hydrophilic. It's designed to get wet and hold water. So it will tend to get waterlogged and stay in place. Whereas bark mulch, bark is supposed to keep water inside the tree. So it's very hydrophobic. It's got a lot of wax in it and it floats away. And as far as, as trying to get rid of stuff, uh, there have been a lot of very successful cases. One of them locally is at the USGSB lab where they take 12 inches of wood chips and, or, you know, they put wood chips down 12 inches deep and use that to kill the, the weeds and the grass because you're not getting that vapor barrier. You're not getting that water barrier, so you're still getting water and um, air into your soils, and then just planting within that, because those green wood chips don't compact down to create those barriers. Yeah. <clears throat> well, thank you guys so much for all the wealth of information that you shared with us today. Um, I just want to again thank all of our speakers, Jim McGlone from the Department of Forestry and, and Tim O'Weiler from the Extension Service and David Wood from the Chesapeake Stormwater Network. Um, and again, I'm Julie Bolthouse with the Piedmont Environmental Council. And I just want to thank you one more time for the presentations that you've give, given and thank all of you for attending this afternoon's session. So uh, we'll follow up with an email and give you all the resources that we've been talking about and happy gardening. Bye, everyone. Bye, Thanks, everybody.